Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to um, our series of amazing talks as part of um, SETI's second annual now, Enchanted Tech Summer Festival. Um, I don't know if you've been following along, but if you haven't, you should start. We've had a series and we'll continue to have through August 19th, a series of just wonderful workshops, speakers, trainings, lab time. We'll be in person at the SETI lab at PSU and also here on our YouTube channel. Um, for details and to join us and to find a schedule, um, go to SETI, C-E-T-I dot institute. Um, our institutes are focusing this year on enchanted objects, augmented storytelling, and interactive murals. And I am so, so excited to introduce our next speaker, um, Craig Winslow. Craig's work fits into all three of these, and we had a hard time figuring out um, when, when he's available, because he's doing so many amazing projects that you'll hear about, but also, um, which of these institutes he fits perfectly into, and I'm hoping he will be back for an encore. But um, Craig is this, an amazing um, artist and designer um, who uses light as his tool, um, creates all these just stunning, beautiful visualizations and immersive experiences, um, stories that are about bringing historical and the past into um, living into the world today in, in places scattered around using these really wonderful new technologies. Um, and through um, that started through his Adobe residency where he launched um, light capsules. And that led to a really, really exciting project um, at the Neon Museum called Brilliant. And he's gonna sort of take us through a lot of different things about his work. Um, and it's just going to be sort of entrancing and delightful. And I am so excited. Welcome, Craig. Um, I will let you talk a little bit and take it away. Um, awesome. Great. Thanks, Nandini. Uh, I'm going to full screen this um, and kind of go into it here. Yeah, I'm Craig. I'm very excited to share this project. I have a couple, uh, you know, projects I've worked on in the past, uh, a lot of things with projection mapping and light mapping uh, and history developing, um, you know, just different ways we can tell old stories to get new excitement around these very fascinating things. So I'll dive into it. Um, I'm Craig Winslow, uh, experiential director and light artist. So I'll, you know, here's some different projects that I've worked on in the past just to kind of give you a flavor of the stuff that I work on. Uh, this is a collaboration with Gemma O'Brien for Lightform in 2018. This is a black and white mural entirely. We're using light to animate it or to fill these kind of white sections. Um, I did a project for the Trailblazers in 2018 as well. This was the pregame playoffs which was super fun to design this concept of like a drop curtain um, and animate all these players. And they ended up extending this through the player intros to get, uh, it was this larger than life kind of Space Jam-esque installation. It was super fun to work on. Uh, and then Brilliant, as Nandini mentioned, um, the kind of culmination of this talk, I'll kind of dive into the process behind making this, but this is a permanent exhibition in Las Vegas at the Neon Museum. And we just did a huge update in December. So if you're in Vegas, make sure you go. It's an amazing place for people that don't like traditional Vegas. The Neon Museum is such a special place for sure. Um, and I'll start here. This is a kind of a, a project I did with all these white objects from my childhood. And I did this kind of multi location projection painted. This is all practical, not 3D or anything. Um, but it has this mantra from the past, build the future. And I unexpectedly kind of inspired myself to live by this mantra of like, how can we use things from the past and change them to like build our future um, and kind of acknowledge the past in, in exciting different ways. So a quick glossary of terms, just in case people don't know, uh, these are important things to know before I kind of go off the deep end and lose a bunch of people here. <laughs> um, first off, projection mapping. I'm sure if you are looking at this, you're probably familiar with it, but just in case you don't know, uh, it is the alignment of projection or video output to physical surfaces and objects. So you can see on the right uh, in the top here, this is an unmapped test version of when I showed up at the Neon Museum as a resident. Uh, that's a test grid. It's not mapped, whereas the bottom is meticulously aligning color and different animations to different signs or different um, you know, objects and shapes. Another thing you're going to know is ghost signs. Uh, if you haven't heard of this term, these are these beautifully hand-painted ads from 1800s, 1900s, uh, really before the advent of um, mass printing and vinyl billboards and everything. Things were painted directly on buildings, 
large, beautiful ads. It took a lot of time and um, painstaking detail and different letter forms that have developed. Uh, but ghost signs is kind of the common term since like 1999 um, that uh, they were kind of made as well as faded ads. And then palimpsest, this is a faded ad that contains multiple discernible layers. Um, this top right one here is actually on uh, Upshur Street uh, and 18th, I believe, in Northwest Portland. And then the one on the right here, Stobart Sons & Co., uh, is in Winnipeg. There are three different layers in that, in each of these, actually, that I've kind of, through research, figured out the different layers there. Uh, so just as a kind of backstory here, um, this is where the project started. I did a projector, uh, I did a, a Kickstarter project called Projecting West. And I drove across the country from Portland, Maine, where I grew up, to Portland, Oregon, where I live now. Uh, and every single day we did a pop-up projection of some sort. This was during the narrative time where we were kind of lost and we were kind of pouring ourselves into this little narrative story that developed over time. Um, and this character we named Little Buddy, his little compass is broken, trying to find his way. We were also trying to find our way as we were figuring out what we were doing across the country here. Uh, but this building really inspired me seeing this black and white type. I was like, oh, I could animate that really quickly and kind of flash them down and it really inspired like, oh man, what can I do here? When I got to Portland, you start seeing all these much faded, you know, much more faded ads. And I grew up in New England. So I've seen a lot of these kind of faded ads in different older neighborhoods around Boston and New York and everywhere. Uh, but I realized I had an opportunity to actually do something with these old relics and use projection mapping as the perfect medium to restore these ghost signs without damaging them. Um, so here's an example. This is in Great Falls, Montana, where I was visiting my aunt and uncle. Uh, Orange Crush ad, you know, vectorizing this in Illustrator, recreating it. I'll kind of share the full process in a minute here. Uh, but this is the project called Light Capsules. So it's an ongoing effort that I call or refer to as augmented restoration. Um, it's taken me a long time to try and figure out like what is the term for this process, but it's my effort of digitally archiving these ghost signs and then restoring them through non-damaging augmented mediums. So AR, uh, projection mapping, anything that's basically not paint or using other mediums as paint. So here's a video just kind of showing what that looks like. I'll let this play out a little bit. So I love adding in that historical context. So, you know, I imagine just a passerby sees this old ad during the day, you don't think anything of it, but this actually had two different layers of Coca-Cola. Uh, this is in Washington, DC, right across from Ben's Chili Bowl, if anyone saw that. Again, this is a palimpsest. So this is another layer in time that was painted on top of it. And then here's a present day look. Now there's actually a mural painted over this by another artist highlighting Duke Ellington and uh, that came down for, uh, you know, a restoration process on the mural, which is a bunch of panels and it actually restored, you know, it revealed this, which you wouldn't have seen otherwise. So really special moment in time to be able to highlight the past and showcase the future as the mural was then reinstalled. So yeah, I was uh, kind of came up with the idea during my Kickstarter, um, applied to the Adobe Creative Residency, and from 2016, 2017, I brought a ton of these signs back to life. I was able to travel to London, do a series there, um, Detroit, uh, Las Vegas, obviously, uh, LA. Um, here's kind of the day to night look, restoring these. And it's just such a fascinating process. Every single one is different. This one is uh, right on Water Street in Southeast Portland. One of my favorites, I've done this a couple times, but it's um, Jacobs and Gile uh, steel jobbers and kind of this nice look of, hey, the top left being super worn during the day and the bottom right. Um, this is a practical shot here, just projecting different fading elements to it. Uh, another one, Sam Moy Co. So kind of just taking a step back here. These are not fonts. They're not typefaces. They are uh, painstakingly recreated by hand. So I you know, no two letters of these are the same. I end up outlining them all with a pen tool and illustrator. Uh, I've done a lot of research and an, am informed by sign painting techniques. So I've learned a lot from, uh, you know, going to letterhead meetups, which is a bunch of, you know, very traditional, super skilled sign painters uh, and sign writing techniques to kind of inform this process. And then also like working as best I can to optimize these beziers for type design 
Uh, obviously, you can see like the O in overalls is like how minimal I can use the points. Um, but the hardest part is the last bullet point here, which is as a designer, really hard. I have to embrace all the imperfections of lettering and spacing. Uh, you might see like Sam Moy, for example, like the O and the Y and Moy, or like I would love to correct that a little bit, right? Like kerning, once you know what kerning is, it ruins everything. Very true here, except I have to embrace it because when I projection map it back, it's not going to line up with the paint that was in this case painted, you know, in 1916. So here's a kind of example. Uh, this is in Albina area of Portland, Samoy. You can barely see the bottom elements there. Again, yellow fades very quickly over time. Here's my digitization. Here's a uh, vector outline, which I love to see. And then here's a, a look at projecting it back. So in this standpoint, everything's there's a lot of logistics in this where I have a you know projector, short throw projector set up right on the sidewalk, you know, trying to get this as wide as I can. Um, other times I might be really far away and I'll be like needing a really long lens. Um, a lot of logistics with projection mapping work. Uh, and want to take a little jump to explain why, why is repainting bad? Uh, you, you know, sometimes repaints happen. Uh, my kind of full understanding and the kind of solution there is really the suggestion is not to repaint because oftentimes it will do more damage than, um, you know, help. So, you know, detailed here, it's it's like a single layered ghost sign. If you have the apprentice or someone from who originally painted it, then that could be seen as, okay, a viable way of restor restoring it. Um, but it's really hard because modern paints now don't act like the lead-based paints back then. They will actually, you know, expand and contract with sun and potentially do more damage over time. So the best effect is really just to let these things fade uh, and uh, enjoy them while they're here and protect them from being destroyed or painted over. Another technique I like to use is um, using Photoshop to isolate color within an image. So here you see, this one is in Astoria. You can see some yellow in here. You can see a little bits of blue. And what I like to do is isolate each pigment to kind of see if I can get any more information of what it used to look like. So this isolating the yellow turns into this and you can much more clearly see, okay, there's the word shoes. You can zoom out. This ended up being like Nyman Judge Inc. Um, Buster Brown shoes which is a very popular type of shoe back in the day. Again, following the breadcrumbs is another technique I like to use. So this is the back of the Palace Theater in uh, downtown Los Angeles. And there are all these layers on here. This was, again, the back of a theater. So they painted show poster upon show poster. But my favorite was this, Best Years of Our Lives. And finding just like enough letters to find that out, I was able to see the IMDb, and all of these names came in that also lined up that are very, very hard to see. So that's kind of a fun thing too. You go down a rabbit hole and then you discover an entire new layer. And I had to vectorize all this like the night before because I finally was able to figure it all out. So during my residency, I was able to go to London, which was very exciting, very you know thankful for that opportunity. And one of my favorites was this one, aside from the streetlights, which are the bane of my existence when you're doing these mobile projection type works. Um, but you know, this one is two different layers. It's in Stoke Newington. And here's what it looks like when you are, you know, it's during the day. Um, I, I typically will make as high res photos, I'll stitch them all together. And I will correct them perspective wise. So I have this perfectly flat, like orthographic view, it makes it a lot easier to put down grid lines and to, and to vectorize. So what I start with is usually the the layer I can see the most of, like what's most clear. So here's the cake bed Roby builders, merchants, and ironmongers. And then I'll fade that, I'll mask that to fade it away to be able to see the lower layer a little bit. So here's what it looks like fading that away. And now I can kind of visually see the lower layer a bit more. And then I'll vectorize that. So here's kind of the, the upper layer and here's the lower layer. So Lower layer, this is what was painted earlier. And I love thinking about the context here because you see, hey, we just opened, we, you know, you you commission a sign writer to paint what you do. The design here is a lot cleaner, right? You have lead glass, oil, you have nice three lines on either side. They're builders, merchants, and then the bottom is another kind of tagline, stained glass and leaded light manufacturers. And then fast forward a little bit, they've now painted over that with they have more locations. They are doing more things. They're ironmongers now. So there's more context. They're, it's also kind of getting a little jumbled where they, you know, they're not focused anymore. They have like five lines on the left and then four lines on the right. It's a little imbalanced, but 
you know, that all is a story that is told in this static sign now. Another great example, Sobart Signs & Co. I mentioned in Winnipeg, we actually just made this uh, the first permanent exhibition um, of light capsules. So I can talk more about that. But here is a view of the archive where if I go back here, like you can kind of discern with the naked eye, like Stobart Sign, Sons Co. And then it gets kind of lost, but without this saying wholesale goods and then the right side here saying Barbara Ellis envelope manufacturers, like finding these historical photographs is sometimes rare, but a really helpful and necessary process to actually solve these. So here it is, Stobart Signs & Co. Wholesale Dry Goods, Christie Grant Limited Mail Order, and then Ames Holson's Tires, Barbara Ellis. We actually got a higher res photo uh, that this has got a spelling error. Holson is actually Holden. We got a higher res photo um, scan and you can actually see that the S was like smudged and it was a D. So that has since been corrected. <laughs> um, but I also love this look, which is, you know, the digital aspect of this restoration process, which is all these vector shapes just, you know, crashing over each other, much like the painted palimpsests um, that are very tangible. Another favorite from a Winnipeg project I did, um, Matt Cohen was my collaborator through these, and he collects these amazing uh, products behind these signs as well. So this is SX Ham. It's a canned ham. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I took it upon myself. I just had to like make a digital version of this so anyone can kind of like swipe through it. Um, there's a Sketchfab uh, under my kind of Craig Winslow account on Sketchfab where you can go to this and swipe around and see this canned ham. And I was able to actually work with that for um, these different elements. So bringing the, uh, you know, the stamp for Canada approved and hickory smoked and the illustration was really, really great to be able to use that from the actual product itself. And you could see fading to what it looks like now. It's, you can barely see the yellow, the cooked ham and all that. So here's kind of a side by side. You can see the cabbage rolls uh, on the right, the lower part here. I just kind of had no idea what the illustration was because we didn't have that product. So I kind of used an Adobe stock, just image searching cabbage rolls and made them green because I've, I've never had cabbage rolls. So maybe I should do further research there. <laughs> but here's a look at how this one turned out. And I was able to use 3D Can to really get some excitement out of um, you know what is typically known as like 3D projection mapping. Um, personally, I don't typically do a lot of the 3D you know, projection-y stuff because it feels a little gimmicky, but here's kind of the reveal here of showing the wall kind of open up and revealing this giant can. Um, you know, we had fewer controlled perspective of people walking right here, so you were able to see it, but just an, uh, you know, editor's note that these things you see on YouTube and stuff typically don't look as good in real life because your eyes are smarter than just a camera, which is a single point perspective. And you, know, you can obviously see that it's not actually in the wall, but it's it's satisfying. Enough. It looks great on camera, great for viral stuff. Um, so this slide I just want to include in here, it's part of a, a talk I did for Intel, but it shows the whole breadth here. And there's a lot of kind of process that is the Adobe suite. I always start with pen and paper, you know, sketching out different things, making notes of, you know, projection studies, drone photography, any sort of like, you know, measuring that I need to do all the way through After Effects, Premiere, you know, exporting things. Mad Mapper tends to be um, my go to for kind of mapping in different things. Um, but uh, yeah, just wanted to kind of show this process. So Light Capsules is its own thing. And then that inspired um, Brilliant, which is a permanent installation at um, uh, the Neon Museum in Las Vegas. And you can kind of see behind there that's uh, Fremont Street, so like the old Vegas Strip and all the buildings, when they get imploded, as they do, uh, Vegas keeps the signs. That's kind of the history, the longest kind of visual history of Vegas are these relics of these signs that some have been just like set aside and broken. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of these kind of magical things. People love the signs there and visiting Vegas is this is such a great place to walk through. So I did this pop up at the very end of my residency and the Neo Museum loved it and wanted this to be a permanent exhibition. So at this point, I was given this canvas and had to make something with it. So the hardest part, I think, was figuring out, you know, doing a pop up's great. You can set a projector up and get a generator and you're good to go. But making something permanent is like another thing entirely. Uh, this space, you know, contextually thinking is they do a lot of photo and video, a lot of weddings and, and shoots there. So 
you know, when I was like, Hey, we're going to have to put some towers in here. That was, you know, I had to do some kind of sell through as far as here's, you know, two towers versus one tower. We can't really put projectors on the sides because it's going to be too many shadows that people cast. So always thinking that way. Um, this is a, uh, looks a little crude here, but this is drone photogrammetry, uh, 3D model that I was able to use that also helped me to kind of figure out where the projectors needed to go as well as, you know, the flow that I wanted to show to start this um, jackpot world, this kind of square over here. Um, that sign ended up being a really great kind of like uh, space to put traditional video content. Um, but really in Blender is where I kind of brought this 3D model into, um, and I made the photogrammetry, I think with um, uh, Photoscan, which is now Metashape. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what that was all processed in. And my friend Kyle Greenberg did a, a lot of help with that at the start. Um, but yeah, this crude model, when you texture it, looks good enough that you can tell, hey, here's you know different areas and aspects of where the signs are, especially in this context where I don't have a, a clean box or a you know 3D um, you know modeled printed something that I can map to. I have a very complex array of broken you name it, glass, bulbs, tubes, metal, everything is kind of just like a heap of, of metal there. So um, beautiful heaps of metal, but you know, not a regular thing. So here's kind of a look at some of my docs as I was planning out the project, figuring out exactly where these towers needed to go, the exact lensing, the level that these would be on, um, if they were you know, landscape versus portrait and our kind of approximate throws. I use Blender, uh, Blender cameras actually to assume what the throw would be based on the lensing of the projectors that we had. Um, so this really gives us kind of a, a standpoint of where things would stand. And then we adjusted some signs to be better like this. Um, you can see the cowboy head here, Terrible Herps is his name. Um, we turned that, you know, so it was flush straight on with the um, projector. Otherwise, a lot of this was just kind of there in place. And then as far as the towers themselves, I knew we needed projectors in there, but here's my rough sketches of kind of what those could be. And, um, you know, it's recommended to me from the CEO that, hey, the, you know, Champagne Tower is this very iconic, very Vegas kind of touch point that people would know if they're a local or have known the history of Vegas. But this was the Flamingo's like first iteration. It was this beautiful, entirely neon Champagne Tower uh, all these were little bubbles that kind of animated up at night as this like champagne bubbles. So I loved that sort of, you know, note when I was like, hey, I want to build a cylinder. That became kind of the inspiration for the finish on the outside of the tower. So here it is, some details. I was able to work with Yesco, who is the, um, actually, historically, they have built a lot of these signs. They're a very iconic, um, you know, sign manufacturer, sign designers, uh, you know, creatives that have made these signs um, over the years. And if you actually look at the Welcome to Las Vegas sign that was signed by Betty Willis is like right at the bottom there, it says Yesco. And so, you know, so it was really nice to full circle have their assistance in fabricating these towers that then brought a lot of their own signs back to life. So here's more details here where it was like, okay, here's our, you know, actual degrees where the, the holes get cut in here and um, we have air conditioners in there and it's, became real eventually. So here's me, um, made a little drone shot shown when the towers first went up and everything was getting um, close. And I'm really thankful, you know, we were able to redo kind of the print on the outside because it was really uh, a little too intense, but here's what the towers resulted in. They're just this beautiful, subtle, you know, texture of that, uh, you know, paying homage to the, the champagne towers, but it's mostly reflective. So all the signs as they dazzle, you don't really see the towers when you're in there. So a big part of the process of making this even possible is uh, structured light, which is a way of using projection mapping. It kind of takes the mapping out of projection mapping. This is a process uh, like that Lightform uses. Um, if people are familiar with Lightform, um, but it uses essentially a camera next to a projector and it takes a picture and um, does this sort of process to give you a look pixel for pixel perfect of what the um, the projector is seeing basically. So I'll take a bunch of different scans here. Uh, Mad Mapper has this functionality, which is what I was using here, um, to then give myself a template to then vectorize. Uh, and then again, I'm like an, an artist, I'm a designer much more than I am kind of a coder or a, a developer. So 
this was my process. We could watch this for another 20 minutes if you want, but I vectorized every single bulb um, and neon tube across eight different projectors in this 360 degree space to give myself vector versions of these, these signs. Um, sometimes, you know, things weren't there, bulbs weren't there, but I just assumed where they would be. A lot of research here, just making sure I'm checking archival images and footage for colors and for animation. Um, a lot of this also is just talking to people and be like, oh, I remember this used to dazzle or, you know, or some assumptions until I'm proven wrong. Um, but yeah, it was just a really fun process. And then also I'm working between Photoshop to, you know, clean up photos and then uh, Illustrator and then those are linked within After Effects and then I'm laying things out in Premiere, um, which production here is like, this was the most intense aspect of this is, you know, again, this is like full behind the curtain here, all eight projectors, I manually animate every single one and need to make sure that they are all uh, perfectly aligned for every single show. So we just did a big update in December, I mentioned, um, it's called Jackpot. So brilliant Jackpot that just launched and we expanded the show from one to three potential, uh, truly triggered by chance, um, thematic variations. So I had to then animate three different variations, but making sure everything's linked. So if I'm changing one thing, everything gets changed. Um, I actually worked with Adobe a little bit to have some custom kind of uh, scripts that would align different playheads. And ultimately it was had a lot more control to copy and paste and get things going. But yeah, it's a uh, it's really a tricky process. <laughs> um, again, everything is linked. So from photo Photoshop to Premiere Pro is kind of like my full um, kind of like uh, process through here. Some of these are like making masks that then get linked. And if I modify the mask, then everything in After Effects or Premiere is then you know updated. Um, and then a dash of the special sauce, uh, as I like to call it, there is um, this custom open frameworks uh, application that uh, software that Michael Hill, who uh, he's he does a lot of work here in um, Portland and with Rose City Games, and uh, he's just such a- I think he's group. lurking on the stream watching. Yeah. You're what? Um, I think he's lurking on the stream watching oh, and kind of said hello. Oh, awesome. Hey, Michael. Um, so this is Michael's work, and it's truly is like, this is the magic sauce for what makes uh, Brilliant so special. And sorry, I can't actually see uh, the comments and things right now, so I'm just kind of going just the nature of Keynote. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I was able to click and then render out these animations where I wanted them. So like nice sizzle up, um, you know, sizzle across, and then these all saved out to ping sequences that I can then use and, and uh, composite. So that creates this. This is kind of the first look when we had everything initially mapped. Obviously there's some masks and fades that we had to kind of clean up, but you know, when everything lines up perfectly, it's truly just kind of this, you have this visceral nostalgic reaction to seeing these signs that you would not expect to be able to light up again, um, especially when you get up close and you see there's broken bulbs and they've been kind of cast aside. Um, it's just such a, you know, emotional feeling people get when they see this show. And then it's a 30 minute experience. So here's kind of the close up. You can see, um, you know, we have this kind of narrative that brings you through uh, like the history of like, these signs are not uh, operation, you know, operational and this kind of awakening moment that I really enjoy where they all kind of sparkle and dazzle. Um, another Portland based uh, studio parallel, um, Ethan Rose, I worked with a lot to create this magical 360 soundscape. So I did the initial kind of soundtrack and, you know, stereo mix basically of like, hey, here's the songs that go together and um, then send that off to him. And he made this amazing, you know, adds all the details and went there to make sure it mixes in three, um, 360 degrees. There's like four subs and like 24 or 28 or 24 speakers that are all 360. So when you see, you know, Lady Luck singing Luck Be a Lady Tonight, it's coming from um, the Lady Luck sign. And then here's a good example. Uh, don't need to point it out, but this is slightly off. Like I think it's one of those things where projection mapping, especially if it's not 100% on, it looks good, but I feel like other professionals will see it and be like, oh, that's not slightly on. Anytime I go to like projection experiences and immersive places, I tend to look like, okay, how, how good is their mapping? Like you go to team lab and you know stuff's like 100% on. So I also want to make sure things are consistent. Um, love this one too. There's barely any like 
glass left in the, the neon there. So um, love this look as well. You know, it's a uh, nice drone shot of, you know, <laughs> actually CBS this morning featured the project when we originally launched with this huge kind of buzz 2018. They used this side by side with the opening sequence um, to Elvis's uh, uh, Viva Las Vegas, which shows some of these exact signs as they go down the strip. Um, so it was really kind of fascinating to get that kind of like pat on the back that, wow, we did something that, you know, it brings to life just nearby um, the, you know, what used to e exist and dazzle and now they can fight for your attention here around you. So that's brilliant at the Neon Museum. Um, I am, uh, I think, ready for some questions in a minute here. I just wanted to show Again, here's the, the breakdown that I used for the um, Intel presentation I did. So I want to show it again here. A, a lot more than light capsules. Uh, there's obviously sketches, soundtracks using Spotify to kind of pull together little playlists um, and people sharing, you know, hey, what's your favorite, you know, Vegas, uh, you know, tracks and development. A lot of Blender 3D is what I use, uh, Metashape and Mad Mapper to do the structured light scanning. Um, and then, yeah, the whole suite of, custom software from Michael and, and um, you know, building plugins for Premiere to kind of optimize and then export and then deploy to the servers. Um, Hap Codec is another big thing that um, is, is great for these kind of, if you're using Disguise or any of these kind of big platforms, there tends to be a different codec than you're used to for just, you know, sharing a video online. Um, last kind of parting thought for uh, Brilliant before I move on to uh, a little bit more on augmented restoration, but this close up here was taken by a, um, a Associated Press photographer that came through to promote the show uh, or to kind of cover the show. And I just love you get close enough and you can see the screen door effect as they call it, which is you can see the actual pixels. And typically you want to avoid this, but I love getting close enough that you can see this digital and physical aspect of something that's so worn and you can see the paint is fading, uh, but you know, it's it's not. It still has this element of digital and physical. So as far as we're talking enchanted objects, this definitely feels like you're surrounded by these enchanted objects. So if you ever make it to Vegas, give it a look. Um, and they have a huge other boneyard um, that is just filled with like the Treasure Island skull and the Stardust sign and a bunch of other works that I worked on with Tim Burton when he had an exhibition there. So a lot of, a lot of fun things. So augmented restoration, again, this term that I'm uh, like have found, <laughs> which I'm just loving lately, uh, you know, the physical artifact remains untouched and preserved, which I think is very important. Um, and the ephemeral restoration is enabled through these augmented mediums. So augmented reality with your phone is, is great. You can overlay different things on the world around us. Um, most importantly, this method enables uh, the capacity to revive multiple layers. So as I mentioned, the palimpsests, those are by far my favorite focus for light capsules as a project because there's multiple layers. If you are going to repaint it, you are destroying, you know, you're, you're kind of removing previous layers in time um, that could be seen if you weren't to cover it up. So projector mapping and, and this sort of method allows us to digitize multiple layers and then bring those forward uh, to show multiple layers in time and actually remove bias that people sometimes show of like, if there's a Coca-Cola ad, you might paint the Coca-Cola ad to restore it, but there might be like mom and pop shop or some other business underneath it that you're choosing to prefer otherwise. So what's next? Um, light capsules, we're doing a, a light capsule. I've actually done a first uh, permanent light capsule in Winnipeg that I mentioned, the Stobart Signs um, and Sons and Co. But Astoria, we're finally like lining up the final dates to install this, which is going to be God, I think it's early September. We've officially, you know, we've got everything lined up. Here's a peek at kind of what we're doing. Rather than a projector, we're actually using, I've been exploring um, uh, gobo light fixtures, essentially. So things that are typically used in theater um, or outdoor, you know, architectural lights and using a kind of line it up grid to create custom gobos specifically for these signs. So it'll be a much lower tech, uh, lower energy cost uh, solution. Ideally, I'm making these solar. This one won't be, um, but you know that's what I'm working on now is uh, you know adding these as a permanent light art installation to different cities or towns around the world would be fantastic where you see it during the day and at night, it's just, you know, comes back to life, especially in the coming years as these continue to fade. 
the light will kind of be a remembrance of what it looks like and animate through those different things. So very excited for this one, especially this medallion here, which this was one of the first ones I did during my residency and I couldn't figure this out. So I just put a, just put an orange circle there. Uh, and last year, this was sent to me, uh, someone on Facebook, I guess, has a, uh, you know, old, old photos that were just kind of sharing and I had to track down to find credit of where this actually came from. But this blew my mind because I absolutely could not figure it out. But there used to be a gas station here and the advertisement here was for Radio Service Co. So it's nice to confirm, hey, I was right with Buster Brown shoes, but had no idea for the rest of it. Um, and I have a beta that just launched actually of this uh, Light Capsules AR app. So all the past Light Capsules I'm working on, getting them in a place where you can actually, you know, geolocated, walk up to a sign and bring back to life what I've revived with projection mapping. Up until now, they've all been like one night only projection mapping installations uh, that you see and then they fade away, which also has its own kind of nice uh, poetic aspect to it. And then the Brilliant Jackpot update that just launched, very excited about this. There are three different variations, as I mentioned. So if you make it to Las Vegas, go check that out. Um, very excited how that turned out. And it's just, you know, by far like my most proud project that I hear messages from people being like, oh, this is, you know, I've lived in Vegas all my life and, you know, I've teared up and love making people cry. <laughs> I'm all for it. Um, so if you want to learn more, lightcapsules.com. Um, I also have lightcapsules.app, which is what I've been transitioning a lot of this, um, these different aspects of the projects to. And then uh, Instagram, Twitter, I'm all on um, at Craig Winslow um, for uh, social things. So I will hit escape so I can see all y'all <laughs> and talk through any questions you have. Here. Um, thank you. Craig, that, that was just amazing. And it was just this like, just mesmerizing sort of journey <laughs> through the, all of this. Um, I have a few questions and I'm hoping people in the audience will start typing some questions at the moment. There's just enthusiastic, like excitement and support for, oh, for yeah. your work. Um, I am curious, um, this idea of, of sort of using emerging technology and light to sort of revive stories that are um, from the past, um, how and you talked a little bit about coming to Portland and slowly starting to play with this. Are there are there other artists that inspired you that you've collaborated with that you've talked to about it um, who who work on similar things? Um, where did you get sort of some of these ideas from? Yeah, I remember seeing. Um, I, I don't know the specific artists off the top of my head, but I know there's been a few projects in the past I've seen um, specifically around Europe and different wartime historical photographs that have been projected. Um, sometimes just photoshopped, but at times I've seen some that were projected on the locations where these different things happen, or there's rubble everywhere. Um, obviously now is just so different from different aspects in time. And I think we easily forget different powerful moments that have happened because we've just cleaned, cleaned it up and kind of moved on or um, forgotten different things. So I like that we're able to kind of bring a highlight to the past in different ways with technology. Um, there's a few different, because actually we're doing a, a I just did a scouting trip in Oklahoma uh, across Route 66, and we did uh, a full scouting of all of the ghost signs we could find across Route 66. And this was thanks to a grant from um, the National Historic Trust for Preservation and uh, road, road ahead Route 66. We're kind of planning for the centennial in 2026. And a big focus is, you know, we found like 240 plus signs you know, some are road signs, some are, uh, you know, painted ads, fading ads, uh, varying degrees of, you know, uh, restorative <laughs> potential there. But I love the focus on, you know, what are the stories that aren't being told or, uh, you know, the fading, literally fading stories that could be like reignited with this sort of focus. So rather than, you know, there's a ton of Coca-Cola ads out there that have been painted across, you know, these big campaigns. There's Apple Cigar, Bull Durham, there are all these like brands of that era that really have a, a large breadth across um, across the country and across the world. But, you know, I, I love finding one that's like a super local uh, optrician or, you know, like a term that you don't really see again, like um, uh, what was the one here? Uh, Grayage? 
drayage. Drayage is a term that I just did not know before I started this. And if you don't know what drayage is, uh, it is kind of the, you know, moving of like one thing to another, not really shipping, but, you know, it's like storage and uh, transportation at the same time. So there's all these kind of like old terms that you can also like pull out of these signs that kind of get lesser used or forgotten. So there are a few questions and I'm going to sort of maybe rephrase or combine some of them, but um, Michael wanted to know, you know, have, have you been thinking towards preservation? You talked a lot about sort of the palimpsests and the layers of signs is almost like, you know, things are in the past and next new things come and, and preserving that is also, you know, that's part, part of a passage. But um, has any of your work or have, have people used your work to sort of stop the degradation of a sign or a or mm. the past and, and can augmented restoration be a form of sort of a call for preservation as well? Yeah, I think um, there's been a few efforts as far as putting like a, um, like a shellac or veneer, some sort of protective layer over these. I think it's really hard because some of these are the way that they are wearing. It, it's like um, they're actually lead paint for many years. That's why they've lasted this long. So there is some like chemical process that is, you know, bricks are porous and they've over the years soaked up the ink and reveal multiple layers in different ways. So, you know, some people are adding like a protective layer at least to prevent, you know, graffiti from happening or, um, you know, it's just so funny to me because it's been a hundred years, they find a way to reveal themselves. Even people power washing a building. There's one in Portland actually, um, I think Autodesk's in there now, but there was this really uh, there was this paper product ad and it had a bunch of like kind of black soot on it and they power washed the whole thing. And it was such a bummer, but you look and you can still see it. Like you can't really get rid of a ghost sign. It is like, if it's on a brick building, it's, it's the remnants of that will be there because it just becomes part of the material. Um, and yeah, I think augmented restoration is like a perfect solution for what to do with these. Like you, you let them fade, but at night have this moment where they kind of come to life. It doesn't involve, downloading an app or having any technology it's more of just like you know someone referred to this as like a one of the best kind of public art you know solutions that you can have because it truly is just highlighting a city's own history and um you know using light to do it is not damaging it's not you know light pollution because it's just isolated to the walls that it's hitting and it's not a brightness level that's going to hurt you know I've, I've just come across zero resistance from people that are I don't know, I, maybe someone in the comments will be the one hater for it, but people tend to like love the aspects of, you know, the ultimate goals of the project, which is just to bring localized people's history back to life. Um, there are a couple more questions, but I, I, I really sort of appreciate this idea of, of sort of these like very temporary memories that made during with light of like bringing back memories and stories. And I want to ask you later at the end of like, what are your dream stories you want to tell about Portland? But um, I've been curious about this as well. And I, I, I'm going to get to the app in a little bit and the, the role that devices can play. But, yeah. you know, you talked a lot about the research of stories and about the technology you used. Um, I'm curious about the logistics of the environment and, and you know, um, Michael brought up you can set up and test at night, but a lot of times you're putting really lovely projectors in the rain or outdoors where or like there's weather, there's people moving around, um, there's light moving around often. So tell us about how do you how do you figure out the logistics of a, a projection mapping project or a project like this? Yeah, kind of like the Stoke Newington one I pointed out, um, there's streetlights. So you kind of have to scout multiple times at different locations if you want to do a projection mapped installation. Um, there's so much logistics as far as, cool, here's a wall, but do I have to get on a roof? Do I have to be in a certain parking lot, like far enough away or too close? Um, do I have trussing? Is it raining? Do we, you know, all these different questions. And I've, you know, done a few of these for uh, the Portland Winter Light Festival in the past. And that kind of comes up because rain is very common during the Winter Light Fest. And, you know, there's solutions for all of it. There's, you know, I think the setup and and breakdown time is kind of the aspect of it because you're also waiting so much later in the winter for the sun to go down. Uh, and honestly, that's kind of the most frustrating limitation of it is during the day, you know, it's you can't overpower the sun. There's no way to do that. So even as a permanent installation, you're only getting, you know, sunset until midnight or whenever you want it to turn off um, to be automated. 
um, which I think is where like mobile augmented reality fills the gap where, you know, if you go to Astoria and it's in the afternoon, you don't necessarily have to stick around, wait till night. You could use the Light Capsules app to then look at the wall and see what the history used to look like. Um, and then there's some spots where like, you know, there's a giant, one of the other signs in Great Falls that I saw uh, had a street light right in front of it. And the only way to change that would be like redirect the light or, you know, uh, block it out or put a bag over it or something. But there's so many barriers to, you know, public safety where you, you're not going to get street lights turned off. Like I've, I've started to go down the rabbit hole and it's just not a very feasible solution. Um, so augmented reality is great because now you have consistent lighting from a street light and you know that this canvas is going to look exactly like it is when the light, you know, so if you're embracing the limitations, it's a lot easier to find a solution. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's the trickiest part too with AR is if lighting changes, if you have like a giant line across it from a building that's casting a shadow, it might have some tracking issues. Um, right now I'm working on a project in Wiscasset, Maine, that's going to launch at the end of this month that is bringing these shipwrecks back to life. And there were shipwrecks in a harbor. And the only tracker you have is water, which there's some posts there. Uh, the tide's always changing. The, the color of the light, like there's, there's so many variables that even geolocation is not going to put them exactly where they were. So the only solution is to put a physical plaque up that's locked down that becomes the tracker um, and then put a, you know, massive 200 foot schooner, two of them behind where you're looking um, and, you know, encourage people. Again, that's like a whole nother user experience to encourage people to keep the tracker within sight, but you're looking at a ship that's massive behind you. So how do you solve for that when you look up and it's just the camera sees blue sky? <laughs> so that one's I'm currently solving now, um, which seems sort of reliable. I'm playing with Spark AR and things, but you know, again, it's always just the local logistics of every single project's a different kind of bag to solve. Um, so you're, you're moving towards, um, you talked a little bit about Gobos and about an app that you can see on, on and like on, on a phone or another device. Um, and both of these are sort of strategies to democratize a little bit the experience and make it sort of accessible or available a little bit more. One makes it sort of cheaper and simpler and the other makes it sort of a little more permanent and lingering. Um, tell us tell maybe a little bit about your transition and you know how what your experiences had and how you, you would sort of go about recommending what, what, what did you do for your app? What, you know, mm -hmm. how did you find all these different tools? And yeah. Um, well, I have a, a good friend, um, Justin Kuzma, who's working on the development of the iOS app uh, and has been kind of a passion project for me as well as for him. So he's been, you know, built the whole new version in Swift UI. It's, you know, all new. So it's kind of a pet project for him to then learn all the new kind of aspects of iOS. So that's kind of a great mutual relationship we have there and getting that launched and playing around with the different kind of AR kit things that Apple offers. And then, you know, as far as the projection stuff go, it, it's funny because I I focus so much on video projection and doing this like relatively advanced stuff with media servers and, and video mapping. Um, but I haven't spent a lot of time doing DMX. So actually the past year working with these more analog, like lower tech, quote unquote, low tech uh, traditional show lights has been kind of a learning process for me as well. But you know, any tool works. You don't need like the most, the, the newest, most intense laptop, um, especially for DMX lighting. Like you don't need some crazy computer. Um, you just need kind of the novelty of figuring it out, <laughs> figuring out how to do like the, how to do projection mapping when you don't have uh, different animations. All you have is a physical stencil that maps to a specific part of the building. Um, and I love kind of finding limitations, like what is the most simple way I can do this? Because you add more complexity and it becomes, you know, those become more fail points. Uh, even in the the Winnipeg installation that we just launched, which have uh, three Roscoe image spot uh, lights, uh, light fixtures. And then we have like a, a Madrix lighting control system and I made an enclosure for it. And then, you know, it's such a rabbit hole making something permanent. You're like, okay, it gets very, very cold in Winnipeg. So I have a heating element. And then that heater element needs to be connected to a thermostat. And 
um, that thermostat needs power and AC versus DC. There's so many of these like things that I've had to learn in the past years to make sure that every little thing is, is done. Uh, the day after we launched, they had a massive heat wave like we're having right now in Portland. Uh, and it fried the SD card that was in there, which was just like a stock SD card. Apparently it wasn't industrial rated and um, it knocked it out for about like a week or two until we got a new card. And then uh, remotely, I was able to publish new show files, send them to Canada and we we're good to go. So there's always like that one fail point, which happened to be a little SD card that tended to be the thing. So it's, I don't know, I've been fascinated with like how to make something as simple as possible um, if I can eliminate a DMX controller altogether, if it can just be like hardwired to, you know, be a manual disc or something, then that would be fantastic. So I think um, maybe that's just also me and my career kind of going through, here's the most advanced XR things happening and then being like, but how would someone have done the same thing 50 years ago? And can I do it with that technology as well? Um, so that's, you know, kind of fun challenge. <laughs> Um, as you talk this through, it's clear you've created a lot of sort of tools and, and little hacks that sort of help you do these projects in ways. And as sort of as, as, you know, as part of our institute, and there are lots of students working on this and learning, is, is other places that you go, that one can go and look, you document your work, or you share these hacks. Um, it just seems like talking to so many different artists and, and mm -hmm. technologists, they all, people have these really like magical little like tools, libraries, hacks they've made for themselves. Mm -hmm. How do you share that? How do you, how do you find that out if you're starting out? Yeah, I would, um, I mean, the best way I learn is just not being afraid to kind of like play with something and push the limits. I think someone explained it best when, if you're in Photoshop or Illustrator, Photoshop's a great example because you have these filters and you can kind of see, okay, there's a dial and, you know, I'm going to ramp it a little bit. You tend to be like, okay, what if I ramp it all the way? Does that break everything? And Typically, you can't break something terribly, you know, unreversibly. Um, so you can kind of see what the differences are there and uh, playing with hotkeys and learning what different kind of quick methods of, of uh, working through an interface. You know, that's definitely a big part of my process is getting familiar with a program, just, you know, spacebar and like different uh, option, you know, whatever Illustrator specifically having these different like hotkeys for it. Um, I could get better at like sharing those sort of things. I think it's definitely like a learned experience as you work with other people, um, you know, kind of, I think even people that I've worked with for many years, it's rare that we actually sit next to each other and see how someone reacts, but like watching someone actually work. Uh, I think Nandini, we were just talking about it before we started this, the stream, but you know, when Twitch creative started, I almost wanted to just like, go on there and have it be like fly in the wall session. Like I'm not like comments and entertaining people are so distracting. I don't want to be like, Hey fam, Hey, you know, like play it up. I want to just like share the process that I'm working on. If it's not under NDA, cause I feel like people learn from that. And I learn from other people just seeing what was that mouse click they just did or like, how did they do that so quickly? And um, looking up tutorials on blender have just been fascinating to like a new retopo tool to kind of reshape a 3D model or um, it just kind of gets you to think of things differently. And um, yeah, I think just being open to exploring or testing something is something that, you know, I, it's hard to kind of break that barrier, I think, when you're first getting into it of like, oh, I don't want to break something or um, like I'm not good enough yet. But knowing that your work isn't doesn't look good enough is kind of the first step to be like, but how do I make it better? Or how do I like learn how to make this better or try something different? So hopefully that's kind of helpful information, <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff that's also just, you know, learned along the way as you kind of like try and fail um, and having resources to ask questions is, is kind of like a big, um, uh, I don't know, like a, a big valuable resource as well. Like if you're able to just ask someone it's a lot easier just to ask someone, hey, do, do you know how to do this thing versus Googling it and trying to find the answer yourself? Um, you know, sometimes it's just easier to just ask someone. I feel like that that whole, you know, I just want to work on my project and have people watch is like a fly on the wall is like getting dangerously close to suggesting a workshop, right? <laughs> right yeah. And hopefully we can convince you to do something like that. But, um, yeah. 
I, want, I have one um, last sort of question, Carmen, which is kind of interesting, which is, is this augmented restoration of, of signs of um, a kind of project that you could say support a town, like create sort of almost a toolkit, um, a mobile toolkit that a town could take and run with and, mm -hmm. and you know, start working on their own signs? Um, is this something you'd like to see? Is it something you've thought about? Um, what are you yeah. thinking? Yeah, man, I, when I first was a resident, I think that was, they encouraged me to like dream big, like what, how would you make this project as like big as possible? And the answer is like, not alone. <laughs> and I think the fun part of it is there's so many different aspects where I would love to have it be a, like a contribution based um, uh, or like open source of some way aspect of the project where I could say, hey, here's the best method to, um, you know, vectorize these signs. And here's the best method to, hey, photograph, like how to photograph these signs is a whole other thing. Um, stitching them together, like creating references that are high enough resolution, um, super inspired by, you know, Dr. Ken Jones, he passed away in 2020 and did a ton of this. Um, he's documented over 8,000 of these signs and I'm working with his family to hopefully like do something with this massive collection of his and you know, he's former JPL and NASA. So these are like the most high resolution scans or archival scans of these old signs, many of which just don't exist anymore. So what are ways that I could, yeah, if there's a resource to how to document these signs and archive them, how to vectorize them, and then people that want to learn projection mapping, like this is a great way to do it um, just by, it's a flat wall. Uh, it is complex content, but uh, another tip I use is inverting an image of what I'm trying to map to, and it creates this like super flat gray, uh, super easy way to like make sure everything's super aligned and mapped versus just like a four corner point. Um, you know, there's all those tips that I could, you know, potentially rope together into some sort of platform that people can submit to. There's a lot of people that love doing research. So it's like, hey, here's the research people like Matt Cohen finding the products. Um, contributing to and then having everyone have credit on like where they've done this and um, you know I, I physically I love it as a selfish way for me to be able to travel like part of the residency was like oh can I go to London and do this and they encouraged me but realistically if I wanted to do a like a project in like India and like simultaneously get more of these signs done I would need to enlist help and I think the best way of doing that is to like yeah share a structure for how each aspect is done and then encourage others to like, hey, please, here's the, you know, the kit for the Gobo that you would need to order and it's all ready to go um, would be a great way of doing that. Um, and then, uh, you know, encourage that aspect to, to happen. So I haven't gotten to there at that point yet, but really like the idea of, you know, creating a way of even just learning the pen tool. Like I, I did a taught it um, a workshop many times in the past of learning how to use the pen tool in Illustrator and, you know, the like more advanced version is vectorize a ghost sign. Like one, you have to really kind of think of where you're putting your points. And then, um, you know, you're also kind of doing good by figuring out what the sign used to say. So uh, yeah, that's, it's a lot, a lot of, a lot of different aspects in that. <laughs> well, these have all been just great. Um suggestions and ideas. And as we talked before, we're doing an XR storytelling project um, around mm -hmm. Portland of historic storytelling um, called X Archive. And, yeah. and perhaps that's a space for a workshop to create a few signs and it'll help you sort of design your toolkit slowly and we're, we're practicing. Yeah. Um, and we have just so uh, you, you just brought up like the series of workshops we're going to be doing in the next week, but we're doing an intro to sort of drone photography tomorrow as part of Enchanted Objects. Right. Um, and a projection mapping workshop um, in the lab on Thursday afternoon, and some 3D modeling and scanning later, and Spark AR. So, um, cool. Hello, we'll be streaming many of them. So, follow along or come to the lab so that you actually get to meet some of these amazing people who create them. But, Craig, yeah. thank you so, so much for this brilliant talk with so many ideas. And I'm hoping people in the, the audience will, will run with them and come up with magical things. Um, but also I'm hoping that now that you've proposed so many other things and have some just lovely projects coming up that we can persuade you to come back for a talk sometime later in the Institute 
and share more of your work. But thank you yeah. so much for joining us today. This was so inspiring. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And anyone that has further questions, I know I saw some comments over here. Um, feel free to just reach out either at Craig Winslow and send me a DM. Uh, happy to kind of talk more and suggest things and, and uh, see what you're all working on. And we will maybe stop being live now, Nathan, and like Great. so that Thanks. we can be invisible. Yeah.